Hey, AP Creek, we're so glad that you could join us. Let's all stand together and worship the Lord. I went down to the river Jordan, laid my burdens on the ground. He took my sorrow, turned it into dancing. Now I'm no longer bound. And we're all singing hallelujah. Ain't no worries holding me. And we're all singing hallelujah. I know you 
was lost but he brought me in his love for me oh his love for me through the sun sets free oh it's free indeed I'm a child of God yes I Lord, it's true, we're so thankful. What a privilege to be called your children. You're the Father in heaven who um, loves us more than we even can fathom. But Lord, what a joy to know that um, you tell us in your word that we fathers being evil know how to give good gifts to our own kids, how much more the Father in heaven giving the Holy Ghost to them that ask. So we can ask, Lord, even now that by your Holy Spirit, you just use this time, teach us, instruct us in your word. Lord, use this time for your purpose and for your glory. We offer this service and pray that all the things we talk about from your word would just be um, right from you. And that, Lord, we'd have ears to hear what your spirit would say. So we pray blessing now. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Why don't you have a seat? Thanks, worship team. Nice job, you guys. Welcome to Athey Creek. It's good to have you here with us on this Sunday afternoon. Uh, you guys ready to get into the word? Good, good. Um, don't forget, by the way, tonight we have Sunday night worship where we uh, do communion, prayer, and worship. Uh, and we'd love to have you join us. The band just leads and uh, it's just a nice time. Six o'clock from six to seven, one hour long service. Uh, and it's just a good time. If you wanna do it from home, you're welcome to join us online. Just make sure to have those communion elements ready at your house uh, and uh, you can join us there too, it's good. Why don't you grab your Bible? Um, we're studying through the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, and we are going through the book of Daniel. But before you go to Daniel, I got a couple other scriptures I wanna show you first, then we'll go to our main text uh, in Daniel chapter 11. So uh, you can kind of get ready for that if you want. Uh, kind of two passages. The first passage, why don't you turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter five. I 
One of the things we've been talking about with Daniel is prophecy. Of course, the last half of the book of Daniel deals with intense prophecy, as it turns out. And, um, and you know, I love this because it gives answers for us about the days we're living even now. Are we living in the last days? That's, that's a good question to ask yourself. And um, the Bible tells us about the different things, the different signs and wonders about living in the last days. And so you ask that question. You know, it's not just the Christian and the Bible prophecy people that are wondering if we're living in the last days. There's other people as well. What about this expert um, on the last days right here? Uh, listen to what she says. This, this, this is interesting. Check this and out. like, the world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. And your biggest issue is... Your, your biggest issue is how are we going to pay for it? Mm-hmm. And... Like, this is the war. This is our World War II. I think she means World War III. But anyways, um, <laughs> uh, the, the point is um, that, uh, you know, even the secularist, even the world is saying, boy, the world's coming to an end. Now, now if you're a Bible student, is climate change the thing that's going to usher in the end of the world? Um, the, the Bible doesn't say it's climate now, there will be some climate issues. The Bible talks about earthquakes in diverse places and disasters and stuff like that. That's a small fraction of it. Um, I, I could almost be more on board when they used to call it global warming. Do you guys remember when they used to call it global warming? Uh, because the Bible says in you know, 2 Peter, the earth is gonna melt with a fervent heat. Uh, that's how God's gonna destroy the earth ultimately. So yeah, climate change, I don't know. Global warming, yeah, you bet. Just in a matter of seconds, poof, it's gonna be gone. Um, that's bad news. The good news is God has a plan and a purpose for everything. And that's why I love going to the Bible on this one. Um, so let's kind of bounce around a little bit here just to kind of get the stage set for what, what one of the great signs of the times we're living. We're gonna kind of explore that in a second. So the first scripture I'd like you to look at with me is 1 Thessalonians 5, verses one through six. And there, uh, Paul talks to the Thessalonican church and he, he's talking about the rapture of the church and the end times and the wrath that God is gonna pour out on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. That's the context of this. And he says there in verse one of chapter five, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now pause for a second. The day of the Lord is a a phrase you should be aware of if you're a Bible-believing Christian. Uh, The day of the Lord is a time where where God intervenes with humanity. That's an important thing because you'll have, you know, people say, well, if God is love, why doesn't he intervene in the world? And why doesn't he, you know, deal with evil? Well, that day's coming. It's called the day of the Lord. And the Bible tells us that that day is coming and it gives us all kinds of hints as to when the day of the Lord will actually happen. So uh, it says, you know, that day of the Lord will come for some people like a thief in the night. Verse three, for when they, not us, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you brethren, now the church, that's us, but you are not in darkness that that day, the day of the Lord, should overtake you as a thief. In other words, we live in the daytime. We see in the light what God is doing. The, the world doesn't see it. They're in the dark and they'll be taken as a thief in the night. But, but we, we get some light. And that's why he says, we'll know the times and the seasons, verse one. We'll know when the Lord's coming or at least the general vicinity, not the day or the hour, of course, but the times and the season, yes. And then he says, verse five, you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Over and over in scripture, you and I are told to watch and be sober. Jesus told us in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew chapter 24, how we should be watching and waiting. The faithful servant is found watching. The lazy servant is saying, ah, whatever, the Lord is not gonna come back. And, and so he goes and parties down, and is not watching. That's called the wicked servant, Jesus said in Matthew ch- chapter 24. So we're supposed to be watching, sober, and waiting uh, for the Lord to come. So, so what are we watching for then? That's the question. 
Um, well, the Bible gives us all kinds of things to watch for. And by the way, maybe the number one thing to watch, if you ask me as, as I study the Bible, the number one thing is probably the nation Israel. Israel's the super sign, if you would, of the coming of the Lord. Um, and there's all kinds of things the Bible says that will happen with Israel and Jerusalem in the last days. Um, let me just give you a quick rehearsal of some of those things. Um, do you remember when God said to the Jews, you know, a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, he said, he said, if you guys don't obey my commandments, statutes and judgments, I will scatter you over all the world. And the Lord did that. Just like when people's phones go off in church, he'll <laughs> scatter you. No, I'm just kidding. No, please. Uh, sorry. Um, but <laughs> this has been cell phone day, by the way, all the, all five services, just uh, phones going off. It's, it's, it's kind of a funny thing. Maybe it's the uh, moon. Um, or people just forgetting to turn off their cell phones. But, um, <laughs> but all that to say, man, uh, we're, you know, what, what, what's Israel, what we just wanna see? Well, the regathering. The Lord says, in the last days, the Jews will be scattered all over the world, but I will regather them. Ezekiel's all about that. We studied the book of Ezekiel a few weeks ago. And we saw when the Lord said, I'll gather the Jews back into their land. I'll make a mighty nation out of them. And we learned that um, we, we're, we're the generation that's watching that happen. If you're old enough here, you saw Israel become a nation in 1948. May 14th, 1948 was an amazing day in Bible prophecy because the Lord says in the last days, Israel's gonna be a nation, not only a nation, but a very strong nation. And Zechariah says in the last days, they will seek to divide Jerusalem in half. That's a prophecy of the end times. In the last days, where, where are they trying to divide Jerusalem? Right down the middle. Um, that's why we were kind of bummed, you know, when we heard our president, when Obama was in office, he said, we need to get Israel, Jerusalem's borders back to 1967 borders, which by the way, what does that do? It chops Jerusalem in half, gives half of it to the Jews and half of it to the Gentiles. Just like Zechariah 12 and Zechariah 14 tell us. We're watching Israel prophecies come to pass right and left, which tells us we're living in the last day. So that's one, Israel super sign of the times. Um, there's other things, you know, Paul tells Timothy, you know, that in the last days, there's gonna be perilous times there in 2 Timothy 3, 1. This also know that in the last days, perilous times shall come. The word perilous is a key word there, um, which, which uh, it really describes the days we're living. The Greek word is chalepos, which means dangerous, harsh, or fierce, savage. Um, and, um, and that's the kind of days I think we're living in. Are we living in fierce and savage times? Well, uh, some of you, God bless you, you're, you're just like, I don't like to watch the news. I stay out of geopolitics. And that's great because, man, you're just thinking everything's great. But if you're one of the crazy people who watch the news a lot and see what's going on around the world, these are troubling times. These are troubling days. As nations are getting new weapons, as our military is being sized down because of various things, money, but also, uh, you know, do you realize how many military personnel we're losing just because of the mandate of vaccination? Like, like it's an amazing thing what we're watching in our nation and the weakening of our military and, and uh, just our whole infrastructure of everything. Uh, but there's a lot of troublesome things going on in the world. Fierce, savage, uh, harsh. We're living in days where people are harsh and mean to each other, fierce. We're watching that. So what are, we, what are we watching for? You know, we're watching for Israel. We're watching for the perilous times that are coming. Um, you know, we're, we, Jesus told us in Matthew 24, all kinds of things to watch for. He said, there'll be earthquakes in diverse places. There'll be wars and rumors of wars and nation. This is an interesting one. Jesus said, nation will rise against nation. Kingdom will rise against kingdom. Well, Brett, isn't that redundant to say nation against nation? Kingdom, isn't that the same thing? Greek word, nation, ethnicity or ethnos. Ethnicity against ethnicity, kingdom against kingdom. Um, that's an interesting thing. Jesus was saying in the last days, various ethnic groups will be warring against other ethnic groups. Racism and ethnic battles, if you would. We're watching that all over the world today and kingdom rising against kingdom. Jesus talked about pestilences and disease will be uh, uh, rampant in the last days. Um, and um, and. Jesus also talked about the abomination of desolation. What's that? Well, if you've been with us in Daniel, you know already last week. That's when this coming world leader will come in the temple in Jerusalem in the last days, tribulation period, and he will set himself up to be worshiped as God. 
And Jesus talked about that. He said, that's gonna be, you'll know that's when the signs are at the end, when the second coming of Christ is gonna be. So what are we watching for? We're watching all these things, keeping our finger on the pulse. But of all the signs of the days we're living, here in Daniel chapter 11, and also in 2 Thessalonians, where we're gonna talk here in a second, um, this coming world leader called Antichrist uh, is one that's part of the signs of the time. And by the way, Antichrist, um, I, I think this name is unfortunate. This is the one that stuck. Uh, it's only John that mentions this character as called Antichrist. There's 30 different titles in the Bible that describe this coming world leader. Um, he's called the son of Satan, the little horn, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast. He's called the lawless one, the wicked one, the prince to come, the king, like there's the Assyrian. There, there's 30 different names that this coming world leader is gonna be called. The reason I think it's unfortunate he's called Antichrist by most is because we picture some cartoon character, a little devil with pink pajamas and a pitchfork running around with a you know, little goatee saying, yeah, uh, uh, and he's doing evil around the world. Um, no, that's not who he's gonna be. He's gonna be a slick, polished world leader. His number will be 666, the Bible says. He will bring in a pseudo peace to the world, um, which is only gonna last for a short season. Um, and, and over the ages, people have tried to identify who is this Antichrist gonna be? Um, I think that's a faulty sort of endeavor to try to guess who the Antichrist is. And I'll tell you why in a second. Some people thought Nero was the Antichrist and understandably he was trying to wipe out the Jews and hated Christians. Um, Adolf Hitler, some people thought he was the Antichrist. Some people said JFK, they thought he was the Antichrist for a while. Henry Kissinger, uh, Juan Carlos, uh, Yasser Arafat. They were all thought to be the Antichrist. Maybe some of you remember this. Do you remember when Ronald Reagan was president? There were some uh, wackadoos that went around saying, Ronald Reagan's the Antichrist. And you'd say, well, why? Um, and, and I could understand it if they might be, maybe tried to say, well, Antichrist is gonna be a slick politician and people will like him and he'll have powerful oratory skills. Well, that was Ronald Reagan. People liked him and he was an amazing speaker and he won even his enemies over because people just liked him. That's gonna be like the Antichrist. Maybe that, nope, that's not why. Why do you think he's gonna be the Antichrist? Here's what they said. Do you guys remember? Ronald Wilson Reagan, three names, uh, that's his middle name. And, and each name has six letters, six, six, six. And so Ronald Reagan is the Antichrist. And you go, oh, okay, wacko. But there's been all kinds of wacko predictions. And by the way, if you're predicting who the Antichrist is, well, you better be sure you're right because you're calling somebody pretty much the devil. Like that's a pretty bad thing to call someone uh, if you're not sure. I think you're Satan pretty much. Well, you better be right about that because that's horrible. Um, now, the reason I will never try to say this is going to be the Antichrist uh, or even really, I'm not even gonna try to guess. I will look for the signs of a coming world leader, but I'm not gonna try to figure it out. And I'll tell you why, because this text I wanna show you, it's gonna say this, that you and I as Christians, we're not gonna be around when he's revealed. When the Antichrist is revealed, you and I won't be here. Well, how do you know that, Brett? Well, turn now, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians. By the way, when I mention Antichrist, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12, along with Daniel 11, these are kind of our two texts for the, the, the afternoon. So Daniel 11 will be in a second. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, Paul the Apostle uh, gives us more information about this coming world leader. Here, he's not called Antichrist. He's gonna be called um, the man of sin, uh, the son of perdition, and, uh, and the wicked. Uh, there's different names here that, that Paul will use. But this is talking about this coming world leader. Uh, by the way, freebie for you, if you missed our prophecy update in the first part of October, we do once a month prophecy updates, I spent a whole session talking about this coming world leader, Antichrist. We looked at him from the lens of Revelation chapter 13, which most impressively matches up all the other scriptures with what the Bible says about Antichrist. Daniel, uh, Paul in Thessal Thessalonians, book of Revelation, uh, and other places, we, we see this perfect congruity in the Bible talking about this coming world leader. Second Thessalonians is one of those passages. Let's take a look. It says in verse one of Second Thessalonians, now we beseech you brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. 
Now, just right there in verse one, there's two events that are being talked about. First, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, number one. And number two, um, this event where it says, by our gathering, speaking of the church, our gathering together with them. I think he's mentioning the second coming of Christ and the rapture of the church. You gotta remember, for those of you who are kind of new to this, there's the first coming of Christ. That's when Jesus came, born in, in Bethlehem, lived and died on the cross. That's the first coming. The second coming is after the tribulation when he returns with 10,000s of his saints. Um, Revelation 19. But the rapture is not a coming. It's where we join him. We, we meet him in the air. He doesn't come to this earth. We go to meet him. That's the rapture. So those are the two events we're talking about in this chapter. Now, some of you say, Brett, I see it right there. The, he says, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ first. And secondly, then he says, by the gathering together in him, the rapture is gonna happen after uh, the second coming. Um, I don't agree with that and I'll tell you why. That's what the rest of these verses are all about. You know, people will quote verse one and say, see, but you gotta just read the next few verses. The whole point of this is to say, and here's the order in which these things are gonna happen. Uh, it's kind of funny. People uh, don't always read the next few verses and you always should. It's called context. Um, so, so let's read on verse two. Um, it, it says, you know, I'm gonna talk to you about second coming and the gathering together and the rapture that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. Um, by the way, whenever you read about the rapture of the church, um, it's always shrouded with the words comfort um, and that you be not troubled. Um, it says, don't be soon shaken in your mind. Um, some of you, I, I know there's some in here that when I start talking about antichrist and the rapture of the church and the end of the world, some of you start to get really anxious and kind of freaked out. There's others you're like, yeah, Brett, this is awesome. What's the difference between those two people? Why are some people like, oh no, not the antichrist and the rapture and the end times, such a scary thing to talk about the end of the world. Um, here's, and I'm not saying this condescendingly at all because um, I've been there. I remember when I was a kid watching that old Left Behind movie, I wasn't sure which was scarier, the fads of the day with the big uh, bell bottoms and the sideburns or that I might be left behind. Both scared me horribly. I remember that little girl in that movie. Do you guys remember the movie? Some of you older folks, the Left Behind movie, uh, where, um, or what was it called? Thief of the Night, I think, is the movie. And the little girl's running around the house looking for her mom because the stove was you know, boiling over on the, on the stove and, and she had been left behind or something. And I thought, that's gonna be me. <laughs> and I remember freaking out. But the person that understands that the rapture is the best thing that'll ever happen to us, that's the person that says, oh, th this is something I can encourage myself and I, I can encourage you with. That the rapture is gonna be glorious. It's something that comforts us. We're not gonna be in the wrath, the time of the wrath of the lamb, the tribulation period. When we're raptured, that's the end of our suffering, pain, sorrow, trouble, and we get to forever be with the Lord. Um, now that's an important thing. Now, now some of you are like, well, Brett, that's all great and everything, but I don't know if I believe in the rapture of the church. It's not even in the Bible. Um, can I just say, I think that's a very dishonest argument when people say that. Um, and here's why. Um, keep, keep stay here in 2 Thessalonians because we're gonna read on. But back in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, it says, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Now what's the trump of God? Well, let me just tell you what it's not. The trump of God is not a trump of an angel. And it's also not Donald Trump, for those of you who might have thought it was, it's not. Um, there's a difference. In the book of Revelation, there's these trumps of angels and people say, see, the rapture of the church is gonna be in the middle because the trump is gonna be blown and that's where the rapture is gonna be. No, those are trumps of angels. This here, in talking about the rapture of the church, says the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that's active, present, indicative. The idea is it's, it's happening as we speak. There's people, the dead people are rising. If you're a Christian, you'll be with the Lord today. Um, some people say, no, no, no. The dead in Christ will rise first when the rapture apps and then the Christians who died before will come out of their graves. No. Jesus didn't say to the thief on the cross, today you'll be in your grave for the next couple thousand years. And then when the rapture of the church happens, you'll pop out of your grave and it'll all be good. No. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's what he told the thief. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, so 
this who is the dead in Christ rising first? They are rising first as we speak. So the dead in Christ shall rise first and they are. Uh, and then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we will meet in the air, both the Lord and those who've gone on before us will all come together and meet in the rapture of the church. Um, the word is caught up there that you should note where it says caught up in our scripture. Um, this is where the word rapture comes from. If you were, you know, hundreds of years ago, reading from the Latin Vulgate translation of the Bible, the word in the Latin was rapturo or repimur, which is where we get our word rapture. And that Latin word merely means to snatch or take away. Um, the Greek word that Paul actually used in the original text, even before the Latin, was harpazo, which means to seize, catch, uh, catch away or catch up, uh, pluck, pull, take. It's, it's very simple. So you can call it rapture or ra rapturo or rapimur or harpazo or whatever. It just means you're gonna be taken up to be and meet the Lord, to forever be with the Lord from that time forward. So people that say, well, the word rapture is not in the Bible, like they're saying something really amazing. Well, the word missionary is not in the Bible. The word trinity is not in the Bible. The word evangelism is not in the Bible. It's like amazing all the words that we describe, notions that are in the Bible that may not be words uh, that you have in your current, you know, King James or, or New International or ESV or whatever. Um, so the rapture is in fact something, and it's not just 1 Thessalonians 4, it's, uh, there's several passages in the Bible that talk about the catching up of the church. And back to our text here now, 2 Thessalonians is one of those passages that talk about the church being taken up. Um, well, what is that? Where does it say that? Well, check it out. It says the day of Christ, verse two, is at hand. Let no man deceive you, verse three. By any means, for that day shall not come except there be a falling away first and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. There's two titles of the Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition there in verse three. But notice there's, there's gonna be something that comes before that. Before he comes and is revealed, there's gonna be a falling away first. The Greek word for that is apostasia, where we get our word apostasy. That the, there's gonna be believers who were sort of once maybe uh, part of the faithful, there's gonna be people that'll fall away or come away from truth, uh, apostasy, which is sad. And by the way, sadly, we're seeing that today at alarming levels. Um, the, there's people leaving the church and millennials and Gen Zers, according to those that study such things, we don't see that as much here at Athey, but I guess globally, there's people leaving the church in the droves. Do you wanna know why I believe that's happening? Is because sadly the church is not actually preaching the true gospel anymore. A lot of churches don't even talk about hell or wrath or sin or repentance. Um, and so it's not really the gospel. If you go to a church and you're, you're gonna live victoriously and you can have health and wealth and, and have friends and people like you and God loves you, God loves you is true. But all that other stuff may not be true. What happens if you're miserable and you live persecuted and suffer? Um, does that mean you're not really a Christian? See, the real gospel is not you'll be healthy, wealthy and wise and live victoriously and awaken the giant within. The real gospel is this, you and I, we're total losers. Sinful, wretched, miserable sinners, and we are headed for hell, all of us. But the good news, that's the gospel, that's what the gospel means. The good news, God loves you so much that he prepared the way, the truth, and the life that gets you into heaven, that's through Jesus. And if you repent of your sins, and you believe upon the cross, that Jesus died on the cross for your sins in your place, and if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins, you will be saved. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ right there. You can't add to it, you can't earn salvation. It's a free gift, you're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, it is a gift from God. That's what the Bible says, Ephesians 2, 8. So, so the problem is when the church doesn't preach the gospel, and if you're a young teenager and, and you're watching some poofy haired guy in a suit say, um, say man, you're gonna uh, awaken the giant within you and, you and we're gonna find you and, and you're gonna find yourself and you're gonna do all this stuff, wacko. 
And, and teenagers are like, that doesn't ring true to me. And I don't wanna be like you. Um, that's what they're saying. Why should we go to church? Uh, we don't want this. But if you tell a teenager, by the way, you're going to hell because of your sin, most teenagers are like, oh, I am pretty sinful. Um, what's, what's the answer to that again? Well, it's because you're a sinner. The Bible says you're going to hell, but Jesus loves you. Forget me and my poofy hair or whatever I'm on TV saying or whatever. Forget the church and, and what you don't like or do like about a church. It's all about, have you repented of your sins and accepted Christ because heaven is there for the person who's saved. Hell is there for the person who's not. And suddenly it's not about your victorious life and your self-esteem and all that other nonsense. It's about heaven and hell, salvation or destruction. One of the reasons I think there's a great apostasia or falling away today is because largely the church, we've got caught up on the wrong message. If you're interested, and I, I recommend documentaries about once every 10 or 15 years, so uh, you can mark this date. But I wanna recommend, if you haven't seen it, there's a, a series called The American Gospel. And it's worth, a, it's worth a watch. I, I would wish that all of you would watch it because it's pretty important. It nails it down. I think you can get it on Amazon Prime for sure. You can get it there. Maybe on iTunes, I don't know, but it's definitely worth a view. And there's two of them, American Gospel, Christ Alone, and then American Gospel, I think Christ Crucified, if I remember right, and those two. The first one's a little easier. Uh, the second one's a little more cerebral, but both are really important. But that's why there's apostasy today is people are not really getting into the word of God. We're more about our feelings and uh, ourselves and about, it's all about us and we're missing it. We're really missing it. All that to say, that's just another sign of the times. Before the antichrist can be revealed, it says here, there'll be a great falling away first. Then the man of sin will be revealed, the son of perdition. Verse four, it says, what is he gonna do, this, this, this antichrist character? He will oppose and exalt himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Wow. This antichrist character is gonna do this. And what is this? This is actually an event. When he shows himself as God, sits in the temple of God to be worshiped as God um, and tell everybody that he is God, what event is this called in the Bible? Anybody? Yes, the abomination of desolation. We talked about that last week. Middle of the tribulation, three and a half years into the seven years. The abomination where he sets himself up to be worshiped as God in the temple in Jerusalem. Don't you, isn't it amazing that, that you know, Paul the apostle here in Thessalonians perfectly is lining up with John the apostles in his revel, revelation in Revelation 13, which is also perfectly lining up with Daniel chapter 11, Jan Daniel chapter seven. Like that's pretty awesome to me. I know some of you are like, what are you talking about? The congruity of the Bible is impressive. So here he is, he's talking about this abomination of desolation, but now he's gonna talk about the timing of when this, this antichrist is gonna be revealed. He says in verse five, remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things? In other words, don't you remember? We've already gone over this. Uh, some of you say, Brett, sometimes you kind of repeat yourselves. We, we talked about the Antichrist last week. Um, remember, repetition is the mother of all learning. Um, and I think that uh, the Bible says a good pastor will put the brethren in remembrance of these things. And so it's good to rehearse these things over and over again. I know I'm thankful for that when I'm able to rehearse things over and over again. Well, anyway, this is what Paul says. Don't you know, we've already talked about this. Uh, he says in verse five and then verse six, and now you know what we withholdeth um, that he might be revealed in his time, the Antichrist. Something's withholding the revelation of this Antichrist character. And then he gets even more uh, mysterious in verse seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way and then that shall that wicked be revealed. Wow. King James really makes us kind of troublesome. What do you mean? Well, we don't use the word let anymore like King James uses it here. In 1611, the word let didn't mean I'm gonna let you in my house. It meant I'm gonna hold you away from my house. Um, it, the only way we use the word let in the old English way is if you're a tennis player. Uh, when you serve and the, and the ball hits the net, they call it, the judge yells out let. And why is it called let? That's what the word used to mean, to hold back. Uh, it stopped the ball from its trajectory and thus it's, it's not a, a legitimate you know, serve or whatever. 
So some of your newer translations says basically, you know, he, now the, the, you know, the mystery of iniquity is already working, only he who now is holding back will hold back until he, the one who's holding back, be taken out of the way. And then the wicked one, this antichrist will be revealed. What's that all mean? Well, it gets back to this thing we've been talking about in previous studies, remember the gap? that's kind of holding up everything in Jerusalem and in Israel. There's a gap we've been talking about. It's the gap of the church age. Now, some people say, well, Brad, I, I, I see more of the Holy Spirit here. He that now letteth is letting, or he that's holding back is the Holy Spirit. Some people say, no, it's the church. I believe it's both, and let me tell you why. Um, remember Paul said, what? Don't you know that your body is what? A temple to the Holy Spirit. You are the church. If you're a Christian here, you're the church. And guess who's in you? It's Christ in you, but also the Holy Spirit is in you and he will come upon you, the Bible says. The Holy Spirit is in his church, in his people. So what this is saying is the one that's holding this whole thing back from Antichrist being revealed and the tribulation period being kicked into gear, what's holding it back? You are. The church of Jesus Christ. Um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, and it gets back to this rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is the event that's gonna suddenly make it possible for the Antichrist to be revealed. And he will not be revealed until the rapture of the church. So it's futile for you or me to say, I think the Antichrist is the Pope, or I think the Antichrist is Joseph Biden, or Donald Trump. You, you and I, what a waste of time. We can't figure that out and nor should we. Well, then why should we study it, Brett, if we're gonna be raptured and we're not gonna be here when the Antichrist comes? I'll tell you why it's important here in a second. But all that to say, here, Paul lays it out. Before the tribulation period, before the Antichrist comes into power, this world leader, um, the rapture of the church has to happen. And then, verse eight, let's finish out the section. Then that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What's gonna destroy this wicked one, Antichrist? The second coming of Christ. He's gonna crush Antichrist. Verse nine, even him who's coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. By the way, some of the churches I was talking about that won't preach the gospel, you'll never hear them share this verse, verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You'll never hear them read that verse. That's too controversial. Um, you'll never hear Joel Osteen share that verse ever. Sorry if you love Joel and his mullet, but I'll tell you, he does not talk about hell and he doesn't talk about repentance and he doesn't talk about God's wrath and judgment. Um, we love talking about the grace and the mercy of God and his salvation and his righteousness, but a pastor needs to tell the whole gospel. And some pastors are just not saying any of the gospel. They're just talking about the victorious you. Watch out church, I'm telling you. But this deception is gonna happen during the tribulation period. Um, does it seem people are easily deceived? Do you sense today that there's deception happening in the world? Boy, I sure do. And you can see the stage being set for this world leader to come and to deceive many. And then the Lord does something that's curious. He will say, oh, you're deceived? Watch this, I'm gonna make you deceived even more. Why would God do that? Do you remember in Romans chapter one when people were stubborn and said, we will not worship him as God, as the creator, but we're gonna do our own sinful stuff. And, we're, and, and the Lord says, there's a certain point where God says, and God will give them over to their own lusts and to their own perversion. If a person really wants to rebel against God, there's a point where God says, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to do what you want and you'll get your way and he'll just give you over. That's what's gonna happen here. People will say, we wanna believe a lie. And the Lord says, okay, you wanna believe a lie? Then you're gonna believe the lie. Hook, line, and sinker. You're gonna take it. You say, okay, Brett, great. Uh, Second Thessalonians chapter two. Um, the Antichrist, what do we get out of this? That he's gonna come and be revealed after the rapture of the church, that which was withholding the church right now. Can you imagine, by the way, if the church is raptured today, how will the world change? 
Like what will, what will be different with all the Christians in the world gone? What will the school board meetings look like next week? If the rapture happened tomorrow, um, all the terrorists would be gone. I'm joking, I'm sorry for those of you that watch, those of you guys watch the news, um, all those mothers that care about their children will be gone. So, so, um, so what will that look like? What will Washington DC look like? Some of you are like, no difference at all. <laughs> the rapture of the church, will it change Washington? Will it change our military? Will it affect our economy? Man, I believe the rapture of the church is gonna change the whole world. By the way, did you know the new age movement has a thing that they talk about? Shirley McLean used to talk about this all the time, about the age of Aquarius. And what's holding back the age of Aquarius where there's gonna be just the state of joy and bliss? What's holding them back? Well, there's certain stingy people that are in the way of the age of the Aquarius. But she would teach in her new age teachings um, Oprah's kind of embraced some of these things as well. Um, and that is that there's a group of people that are kind of causing all the trouble, not allowing the age of Aquarius to be brought in, the age of enlightenment. And there's gonna come a time where there's gonna be a mass disappearance. And that disappearing of the people that are kind of in the way, they'll be taken out. And then the age of Aquarius will be brought in. There's a whole new age teaching of that. Um, uh, the problem is, uh, there will be a mass disappearance of people and they're the same people that they don't like that are gonna disappear, true. But as it turns out, instead of being an age of enlightenment, it's gonna be called the age of the tribulation period where God's wrath is gonna be poured out on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. But be that as it may, that's 2 Thessalonians. Now, let's go back to our main text of the day. You're like, wow, it's almost one o'clock, Brad, and you guys, you're barely even at the text. Well, we'll hopefully work through this. this is, we're getting some work done here. Um, so Daniel chapter 11 the first half of this chapter is Daniel receiving a vision that we started talking about in Daniel chapter 10, when the Lord revealed himself to Daniel and through the, the angel Gabriel uh, and Michael came and fought. We talked all about that last week. But what vision does he get? He gets a vision about the near future, about the Greeks, the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemies. And we're gonna talk on Wednesday night all about the first half of this chapter. And it's a crazily intriguing chapter about history. We're gonna talk about uh, you know, uh, Mark Anthony and Cleopatra, they're actually referred to in Daniel chapter 11, historically, uh, interestingly enough. But we're gonna ultimately get to the Ptolemies and the Seleucids and Antiochus Epiphanes, who's a type or a picture of this coming Antichrist. But then about halfway through Daniel 11, Daniel sets his gaze further than Antiochus and goes into the future of the end of the world and says there's actually a leader that's like Antiochus but he's gonna be even worse. And this is the Antichrist, the same guy um, that uh, you know, Paul talks about, book of Revelation 13 ch chats about. Some people say, no, I think this whole chapter is about um, Antiochus and not about the Antichrist. The problem that you have there is Antiochus came and went around 170 BC. That happened already. Then who would, who would Paul the apostle be talk, talking about in 2 Thessalonians chapter two? Um, and who would John the apostle in, in the book of Revelation be talking about in Revelation 13? In other words, the, the, the abomination of desolation, if it was just Antiochus, why would Jesus bring it up, you know, 170 years after it already happened saying, like Daniel the prophet said, when that abomination of desolation comes, flee to the wilderness. Remember when Jesus said that? So, so the people that try to say, this has already happened, Daniel chapter 11 is just Antiochus, uh, you know, the Seleucid empire and all that. Um, they're, they're not being honest again. Again, you can't teach the whole Bible and make up these things that sound great uh, in just a small context. The whole context of the Bible has to work. So Daniel's gaze goes past Antiochus and in verse 36 is where he starts talking about the future leader called Antichrist. Let's read verse 36. It says, and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women nor regard any God for he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate um, or you know, in, instead of th that, you know, he shall honor the God of forces and the God whom his fathers knew not 
shall he honor with gold and silver and precious stones and pleasant things. Now, pause there in just a minute. We're gonna finish the rest of this chapter so that we set ourselves up nicely to to do the first half on Wednesday night. Um, There are several things here uh, that are mentioned of who this Antichrist character. We learn more stuff here from Daniel 11. So let's break it down. Number one, if you're jotting down your notes, you can scribble them down if you want to. Number one, he, this Antichrist, according to verse 36, will do according to his own will. Um, Now, Antichrist, when we see the word anti or the prefix anti, we often think, think of the word against, to be against. And that's true in modern vernacular. But in the Bible, when you see the word anti, it can also and actually primarily mean in place of in place of Christ. That's an important thing to know because that's really what Antichrist is. He wants to sort of dupe people to believe that he is the Messiah, that he's the one the world's looking for, and the Jews are gonna think he's the Messiah. And I believe that there's others, including the Muslims, who might think he's their Mahdi. Uh, I won't get into that, that's a whole nother, the 12th Imam and all this stuff. But all that to say, so many people are gonna believe he's the answer, this coming world leader. So when we compare him to Jesus Christ, we see quite a a compare and contrast. Um, Who else did according to his own will? Anybody wanna take a stab at that one? Satan, right, Lucifer. Do you remember Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How thou art cut down to the ground, which doth weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I will, I will, I will. That's Satan. Isn't it interesting that the Antichrist says, he, this king will do according to his will. Now consider the true Messiah. Did Jesus always do his will, his will, he'll, I will do this and I will do that? No. If you know Jesus, totally opposite. I love John chapter six, verse 38. Jesus said, for I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Um, Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane there before they took him to the cross. He said, oh Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Jesus uh, was not all about his own will. So one of the marks of the Antichrist is he's gonna be very much like Satan. That's why he's called the son of Satan uh, in some context. Um, Number two, it says in verse 36, not only will the king do according to his will, he shall exalt himself um, and magnify himself above every God. We'll talk about magnifying in a second because he says that again, we'll make that another point. But the idea of exalting himself, this is what Antichrist does. Is this another thing that Satan does? Does Satan exalt himself? Yes, we just read that in Isaiah, but also if you know, this idea of Satan, um, what was his biggest sin that made him get tossed out of heaven? Pride. He was lifted up with pride, exalting himself. And by the way, this is something that we can see as the sign of the times. You know, a person that exalts himself fits right in our culture today. It's, it's cool to be all into yourself. I mean, if you look at our, you know, uh, musicians and artists, if you're very full of yourself and you think you're amazing or, you know, like it's amazing. I could list off all kinds of famous people that are as full of themselves as a person could be. And it's, it's sort of a popular thing. In fact, our culture celebrates sort of exalting yourself, whether it's McGregor or Trump or Biden or, you know, um, you know Madonna or Beyonce or whoever you wanna say, exalting yourself, that's hip and cool. In fact, we all live to do it on our Instagram account. We wanna exalt ourselves, make ourselves look good in the pictures and wow, you're amazing, look at you. And that's our culture. The Antichrist is gonna feed that and he's gonna do that as good as anybody. Exalt himself. What did Jesus do? Philippians 2, Jesus made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of the servant. The one autobiographical statement Jesus ever made, I am meek and lowly in heart. Very different than this antichrist who will exalt himself. Um, Number three, he will speak against the true and living God. Is it hip right now in the world to talk against the true and living God? 
Man, people talk and bash God all the time. You know, if you're watching Kimmel at night, he loves to bash the Bible and Christians and God. And, and if you hear people on movies and TV and stuff, using the name of Jesus in vain, people just love that. People pay money to go see movies of using our Lord's name in vain. You know, the speaking against the living God, that's celebrated today. You remove the church out of this world, this guy's gonna come and say horrible things. Uh, it says he'll speak marvelous things and it doesn't mean more marvelous. It means people will marvel at how horrible he'll speak against the God of the Jews and the God of the Christians. Um, that's gonna be a horrible part of the uh, Antichrist, the way he rolls. Then next in verse 36, he also says, he will prosper until the indignation. Now, this is an interesting, two, two things, prosper and indignation. First, prosper. The word prosper here in the original Hebrew is linked to another concept of evil and, and demonic power. Uh, what do you mean, Brett? Well, do you remember in Daniel chapter eight, verse 24, we read, um, and his power, this antichrist, will be mighty, but not by his own power. Question, whose power will he be under? Satan, as the church lady said, and shall destroy wonderfully. Uh, again, that word wonderfully cracks me up. It means people will wonder at how horribly he'll destroy stuff. And he shall prosper and practice. Now this is getting closer to what this prosper thing's all about. The word practice is linked, like if we said practicing witchcraft, this antichrist character is gonna prosper under the power practicing with the power of Satan. His prosperity will link to the power of Satan and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. That's the Jews. Um, so that's the first thing when it says he will prosper and practice. That's black magic, dark, evil, gross stuff. And his power will be of Satan. And then the second word there, indignation. When will his power of practicing evil come to an end? At the indignation, which means wrath. Um, so when's the wrath come? Christ is gonna pour out his wrath upon a Christ rejecting sinful people in the tribulation period. And the second coming of Christ will crush Satan and the antichrist and the false prophet, the unholy trinity of the book of Revelation. First Thessalonians 5, 9 says that we are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation. That's why we're not gonna be here. The rapture of the church has to happen first because we're not appointed unto this time of wrath and indignation, but it's the wrath an indignation that'll be the Antichrist end. We'll show you that here in a minute. Revelation 6, 16 calls the time of the tribulation period after the rapture of the church, the time of the wrath of the lamb. Now this always cracks me up because some of you are like, well, that sounds scary. Little fluffy lamb and it's gonna be real mad. Me? <laughs> well, don't worry about that because remember, this is what you have to understand. Jesus was the lamb of God that came to take away the sins of the world as a sacrifice. But don't make the mistake. In his second coming, he's gonna be the lion of the tribe of Judah. The first time he came as a carpenter, the second time he comes as a conqueror. The first time he came to be judged in front of men, the next time he comes, he's gonna be the judge over all men. Don't make the mistake of thinking Jesus is this little lamb who's gonna come and pour out his wrath, no. Um, I've heard it said, what are we supposed to be afraid of, Lambo? It's like, uh, no, it's, it's, it's Jesus, the conquering king. His wrath is gonna be poured out. Um, well, that brings us to number five, interesting phrase. He will not regard the God of his fathers. Now there's all kinds of theories about what this means. What does it mean that he will not regard the God of his fathers? Well, the word God there is interesting. The word is Elohim. And Elohim can mean God as we know him, the true and living God, Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one and only true God. But in the Bible, it gets a little confusing sometimes for some people because the word God can also be Elohim, false gods, pagan gods. They're also called Elohim. And what makes it even more confusing is the word is plural. So in Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, which means gods. Brett, are you suggesting that there are many gods? Definitely not. There's only one God. Isaiah the prophet says, only one God. There's no one like him. Um, all the others are false gods. So then why would it be plural in Genesis 1, 1? Answer, uh, 
Who was there at creation? We know from Colossians that Jesus was there at creation. We know from Genesis one that the Holy Spirit was there. Remember the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters. And so you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one, the Trinity, the mystery of the Trinity. Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness that God, that's the Father, manifest in the flesh, that's the Son, uh, glorified in the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, all in one, that's great is the mystery of godliness. So when the plural is used in Elohim, speaking of God, we're referring to the Holy Trinity that is one God. Um, I know, confusing, but uh, if you try to figure out the Trinity, good luck with that one. It is a mystery, the Bible even says that. But what makes matters even more confusing, sometimes the Lord uses in his word, the word Elohim for both the true God and the false gods all in the same sentence. A good example of that is Daniel chapter one, verse two, where it says this in Daniel one, two, and Jehoiakim was the king that was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. And it says that Nebuchadnezzar took the vessels from the house of his God. What's the house of uh, Jehoiakim's God? The temple in Jerusalem. What God are we talking about? Jehovah, because he's the God of the temple in Jerusalem. Are we still tracking? But that word is Elohim there, talking about the God of the, t of the t temple in Jerusalem. Then at the same verse, it says, and then they took those vessels and brought them to the land of Shinar, where they put the, the vessels into the temple of his God, the Babylonian God. And that word is also Elohim. Don't be freaked out by this. Don't be troubled by this. The word Elohim is a title and the title is God. And the only thing you have to kind of remember is there's a true God and a false God. Now, the reason I go into all this stuff is because this is where it causes all the consternation. Some people say, when it says he will not regard the God of his fathers, they say he's gonna be a Jew because the God of his fathers, that's an idiom of the Jews. You know, the, um, uh, so-and-so, King David, you know, worshiped uh, the God of his fathers, uh, you know, and all that stuff. And so there's a, that is true. And that could mean that he's a Jew, but I wouldn't use this phrase to say for sure that, um, because it could also be Elohim, the gods. He did not regard the gods of his fathers. And there's another verse coming up that uh, is gonna kind of imply that we're talking about a Gentile person, not a Jew. Let me just give you a few other reasons why I think he's not gonna be a Jew. Uh, one is he's gonna hate the Jews and make war against the Jews. Uh, some of those people say, so what? That's what he's gonna do. But remember the, the picture of Antiochus Epiphanes that we already have talked about? That he is a picture of the coming Antichrist? Um, was he a Jew or a Gentile? Anybody? Antiochus? He's a Gentile. Because remember, he came from the Seleucids, which came from the Greeks, which was part of Alexander's, the great four generals, remember that? So he was a, a, a Greek dude, basically, Antiochus was, and he was not a Jew. Um, so uh, when it talks about this uh, picture, as far as the Bible goes, I think it's, it's more likely in typology that he will be a Gentile. Also, do you guys remember in Revelation 13, um, we talked about the, the beast, Remember that if you were here on the prophecy update, we talked about the beast. Does anybody remember where does the beast arise out of? Anybody? The sea. And if your expositional constancy is intact, what does the sea always typify there in the book of Revelation? The nations of the world. The nations of the world. The beast, the Antichrist is gonna come out of the nations of the world. That's not the kind of language you'd use if it was one of the Jews. Uh, so I believe the Antichrist is gonna be an anti, uh, the, the Gentile. But again, you can do more research on that if you'd like. Number six, um, he will not regard the desire of women. Uh-oh, this causes even more controversy on who this Antichrist will be. Some people say, well, this tells us he's gonna be a homosexual. Um, <laughs> I remember when I first heard this theory back like 40 years ago, somebody mentioned this, and back then nobody could imagine a homosexual being a world leader. Like, how's that gonna work out? Um, that just shows, for you younger people, there used to be a time where everybody kind of thought homosexuality was wrong. Um, now that's not in place. Now you people celebrate, you know, homosexuals and, and we just put a new transgender guy in, or guy in, in charge of military and stuff and we're all confused. What are we gonna do? Uh, anyway, times have changed. Um, but so is it that he's gonna be gay? I'm not sure that's what this is talking about. 
Um, actually, the, not regarding or the desire of women, there's a second theory I've read in some commentary somewhere that he doesn't give his soldiers, which he's gonna have a, a military and he's gonna have a huge war machine, that he doesn't give his soldiers time off for conjugal visits to their wives. Some people say that. I don't know about that. Um, some say he's gonna be abstinent. Don't know about that either. Now here's one that's kind of an interesting one, your NIV Bible. If you've got your NIV today and you're reading this where the King James says, um, neither will regard the God of his father nor the desire of women, the NIV puts it, uh, uh, um, he'll be the one desired by women. That's an interesting one. Why does the NIV use that? Well, as it turns out, um, the, the desire of women, that was also an uh, uh, idiom of the Jews back in the day. Um, the desire of women was speaking about as a title uh, of, the, of the Messiah, Jesus. Um, why would that be called? Was he good looking and the women thought, oh, he's so handsome? No, it's the idea that um, the desire of every Hebrew woman was to be the mother of the Messiah. They hoped and prayed that they would be the blessed woman that got to give birth to the Messiah to come. And so one of the nicknames or titles of, of the Messiah to come was the desire of women. So this would say then, if you read it that way, that he, the Antichrist will not regard the desire of women, the, the Messiah uh, that's, that, that was gonna come for the Jews. He will not re regard Jesus, the Messiah. So you can kind of read into that and think about that more when it comes to this not regard the desire of women. Those are the four most popular theories, perhaps. There's a few others out there as well. Uh, but then we're getting closer to the end here. Number seven, um, it's, it's, he will magnify himself above, above every God. Um, this is what he's gonna do, above all gods. Um, he's, he's gonna say, I alone am God, worship me. Uh, and he's gonna do that at the abomination of desolation uh, that we've talked about. What did Jesus do when he came? Jesus said in John chapter seven, verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeks his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true and no unrighteousness in him. Jesus always sought to glorify the Father. Antichrist seeks to glorify himself. Now, this is the last of the little descriptions here. Uh, number eight, he will honor the God of forces, it says here in verse 38. A God which his fathers knew not, um, but he will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. He's gonna put all his money, gold and silver into honoring his God. And your margins, many of your Bibles, your margin reads munitions. Some of your translation says what, fortresses? Um, he will honor the God of fortresses and forces and munitions. The idea, weaponry, military might. That's gonna be the God that he worships to become more and more powerful with more and more weaponry. Well, what's he gonna do with all that weaponry? Well, this is where we, we finish up this chapter and we read the, the final few verses. Let's take a look. Verse 39 tells us, it says in verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, the munitions and forces, whom he will acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. The word gain there is for financial profit. He's gonna go to war against local nations and he's gonna get wealthy off of uh, these nations by conquering them. And verse 40, at that, at that time, at the, end, uh, at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. <laughs> and rain. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, right when I said it with a whirlwind, it's like, whoa. <laughs> this is like a 3D sermon right here. <laughs> uh, with a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And he shall enter into the glorious land. Where's the glorious land, anybody? Israel. And many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, the chief children of Ammon, or Ammon. Um, now, before we read on, there's a bunch of things that were said here that's kind of interesting. First of all, this king of the north and king of the south, who are they? Don't know for sure. Could be Egypt and Russia. But I thought Russia would be destroyed by this time in the Gog-Magog War, yes. 
but we know that it was five sixths of the Russian army that will be destroyed in the Gog Magog army battle of Ezekiel 38 and 39. So many believe this could be a regrouping of the Russian army during the tribulation period that will sort of push against this coming world leader Antichrist, kind of interesting, along with the Egyptians, some say from the south. But it says they're gonna come like a whirlwind with horses and chariots and all this. Now, some people are really hung up on the horses and chariots. Come on, Brett. Why would Daniel say there were horses and chariots in modern day warfare? Um, I don't have a problem with this. If you're Daniel and you see some glimpse of modern warfare, what are you gonna say? Um, what, what do you have to reference modern warfare other than chariots and horses and a whirlwind? Um, like, and ships and stuff. Like, Daniel's probably just thinking, man, what in the world did I just see? Daniel just says, man, weapons of warfare is kind of what he's referring to. By the way, I think the apostle John might have been up against this when he was receiving the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, how do you explain modern warfare? What if John, the apostle, saw modern things like an Apache helicopter? Have you ever thought about that? Um, could it be when John says about the modern day warfare, when he says we saw, he saw giant locusts with faces of men, but also fire coming out of their nostrils? Like that sounds like an Apache helicopter to me, a big locust. He did a good job. Pat John on the back, man, that's a good description. <laughs> big, big grasshopper with wings that can brrr and fire, little faces of men. That's an interesting description. But these guys had to explain modern weaponry. I think Daniel's just saying, the idea is chariots of war could have been a Humvee or a tank or a personnel carrier or something like that. Who knows, but I think that's what's gonna happen. He's gonna have these weapons and he's gonna go into the glorious land, Israel, set up camp in Israel and battle against these other nations. But, verse 44, but tidings or news out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. What's gonna freak him out to where he goes with a fury to fight tidings out of the east? And, and now this is where you have to, again, compare scripture with scripture. In the tribulation period, the Bible says there's gonna come an army from the east. And I think there's a hint as to who this army might be. And it's because it's one of the few armies that can actually do this. It's an army from the east. Does anybody remember Revelation chapter nine when we read about this in 916 of Revelation? Do you remember how many people are in this army that marches from the east in Revelation nine? Anybody remember? 200 million. And you say, well, big deal. Okay, that's a pretty big army. But you have to understand when John was told to write that by the Holy Spirit through Jesus, the Revelation, um, did you know there weren't even 200 million men on the earth when John wrote that? Like John's writing, okay, army, battle. What, Lord, how many? The Lord's like, just write it. Okay, 200 million men. It's like, you know, it's like, you wonder if John was like, are you kidding me? Um, but, you know, it was an interesting thing. Some of you are old enough to remember in 1969 when Radio Peking, that was, as it was called at that time, announced that they could outfit a 200 million man army. That was uh, today, you know, of course, China. And it's interesting because China is ramping up their weaponry exponentially right now. And it's funny because we don't hear about the United States and the prophecies of the Bible. Um, and who knows why? Maybe it's the rapture of the church will just totally kind of decimate our nation and our ability to be effective with anything. Or maybe we do that by ourselves next week. I don't know. It seems like we're doing a good job of destroying ourselves as we speak. But we're not gonna be a player when all this goes down, apparently. Bible doesn't even mention the United States, but it does mention China and it does mention Russia. Tidings of the East are gonna come to this Antichrist and go, uh-oh, and he's gonna, with a fury, start going that direction. But it's gonna be during that time, what happens? Well, it says, verse 45, and he shall plant taber uh, the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, that is the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea, uh, uh, between the seas of the glorious holy mountain, that's Jerusalem, Yet, here it is, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. That's gonna happen at the final battle when all these armies of the world converge in what is today the Valley of Megiddo or Armageddon where all the warfare is gonna come together and Christ is gonna return. And at that time he will crush this coming world leader. His wrath will be poured out upon him. So at the end of this, the last section, Daniel chapter 11, verses 39 through 45, kind of spells out in sort of a quick way 
what he's gonna do with his weapons and it's gonna come to an end at the Valley of Armageddon. Now, some of you are like, okay, Brett, phew, thanks. Are we done yet? Can we go now? Um, here's the thing, why is this important? Especially if you're saying, Brett, we're not even gonna be here. If you're right, the rapture of the church happens and then all this stuff comes down. Who cares? We'll be at the marriage feast of the lamb up in heaven. Um, true. But do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I mentioned this? When you're walking around Home Depot somewhere in August or September and you see, oh wow, there's the Christmas decorations. Trees and lights and the little deer that you put up in your front yard, you know? Um, and you got all that stuff. Um, you're like, what do you know? When you see at the Home Depot, all the Christmas decorations are coming out. What does that mean? Thanksgiving's coming. You say, no, Brett, Christmas. Nope, nope, Thanksgiving. Same thing with Antichrist. We're not looking for Antichrist. You and I are not looking for Antichrist. We're looking for Jesus Christ. However, when you see the decorations come out and you start seeing the world need a leader, a vacuum and a globalism and a movement toward a one world religion and a one world government and all these attributes of this antichrist character of pride and arrogance that fits right in with the world's narrative today. What we're seeing is, wow, if the antichrist is on the cusp of coming into this world, which I believe he possibly could be, that means the rapture of the church can happen at any moment. Um, Thanksgiving. Uh, Christmas is coming for sure, but Thanksgiving comes first. Just like, you know, the tribulation and this antichrist is coming, but the rapture has to happen first, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter two. So what does that do? It, it makes me excited because I believe these are exciting times, you know, and, and when you feel like the world is falling apart, if you're one of those people that watch a lot of news, you know, man, the world's falling apart. Just remember, it's coming together. The, the situation in the world is coming together to do exactly what the Lord said he would do with the world. That should bring us comfort and peace, joy, knowing that the rapture of the church is soon. And then one final thing it should do, should we just sit around and go, well, I guess the rapture is coming, so we're just gonna sit around and talk about the rapture. Is that what we should be doing? What should we be doing? If the rapture of the church is soon, you and I should be busy, busy, busy about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone we know. Your neighbors, the kids that go to school with you at your high school, your college professor, even though he seems like the last guy in the world that would accept Christ. We should be busy doing the, the great commission, going to all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing, making disciples of people, not just Pastor Brett, not just Athey Creek's pastoral staff, all of you. We should be busy about the kingdom. There's so many lost people that need to hear the gospel. The harvest, you know, is plentiful. The, 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 you know, the workers are few. We need more workers. And in a day where I think we're seeing signs of the times that are short, I think we should be all about pointing people to Christ that they might repent of their sins and be saved, that they might go to heaven. That they'll be raptured with us, taken up to heaven. Um, well, what if they don't? And what if they hear the message? Did you know that even after the rapture, there's still a chance for a person to be saved during the tribulation period when all this stuff comes down? It's gonna be brutal. And if you can't be a Christian now, I worry about, will you be able to be a Christian during that time? Because it's gonna be way worse. It'd be better to accept Christ today. So if you're watching online or if you're here this afternoon and you need to be saved, you've yet to repent of your sins and accept Christ, I just wanna urge you, according to the signs of the times that we're seeing in the world, this is, this is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Don't wait any longer. Accept Jesus and have your sins forgiven and the hope of heaven. In Jesus' name, let's pray together. Lord, I, I'm so thankful for the gospel. Um, this would be horrifyingly scary stuff to know about the end of the world and the, all the stuff. But, but Lord, when we know that you have a plan and your plan is is so clearly evidenced, even in the, the, the geopolitics of the day. We see all these things your word tells us, the regathering of the Jews, um, the, the movement toward a one world religion and government. We see all that, Lord. Um, we see even some of the things that are so troublesome today with the coronavirus and mandates and things that cause so much consternation and struggle and strife. We just see all of this as signs of the times. So what should we do, Lord? We just wanna be faithful. Um, I pray that we'd be light and salt in this dark world and point people back to you, that many might come to know you, that many might be saved. 
Give us strength, give us boldness. Forgive us for being timid or afraid. I pray that we'd be bold in sharing the good news. And even at risk of seeming weird or wacko, Lord, um, we know people have ears to hear if people will just speak the truth. Um, Help us to be bold in the truth of the gospel. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen.